Hi, I'm Christine Comerford of Smart Tribes Institute, and I'm a leadership and culture coach. Today on the show, we're going to talk about the five rights you had no idea you had and how they drive and dominate your behavior and the behavior of your team members. We're going to talk about how to find meaning and purpose and juice in the work that you do. And we're also going to really uncover and unpack what is it that causes leaders to feel so isolated and unfulfilled. I can't wait to see you on the show. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. I'm your host, Dov Barron, founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything. Let me ask you, are you committed to up-leveling your leadership? Well, today, we look at the neuroscience of leadership. What you don't know about your brain may, make, may be making you a bad leader, so stay tuned to find out. Remember, you can chat about this episode or any past episodes by going to Facebook and looking for Doug Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. If you're a new listener, new viewer, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. You're about to go full Monty. As always, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you tune into podcasts. Uh, we always need your help in staying relevant. So please go over to wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes or anywhere else. Rate, review, and subscribe to the show. That really helps us to stay relevant. You can also catch us also on traditional radio stations across the United States every Monday and Thursday, all the way from Philadelphia to Colorado, and now in Washington, D.C., in the Washington, D.C. and Quantico area, you can find us there, too, on 96.7 FM. You also catch us on Roku TV, where there's over 100,000 uh, subscribers. And if you're a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners for every single episode. We're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. Did you know you can also tune into us through Spotify, Alexa Home, or Google Home? Just say, play Dog Baron Podcast. All right, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you are a CEO, someone in the C-suite, sales leader, entrepreneur, leader in any capacity, you know that the heavy demands of being on the cutting edge can disconnect us from the things we care most about, not least of all, ourselves. There's always a news trend that comes out of Silicon Valley to help busy executives connect them with themselves and have greater levels of clarity, whether it's meditation. But, you know, whatever it is, these trends tend to be fleeting, like intermittent fasting or taking psychedelics or doing adrenaline sports. They all go in and out of vogue. The truth is that you can't do enough intermittent fasting or take enough psychedelics in hope of creating any level of sustainable clarity. But what we really need is a neuroscience-backed solution to disconnect from the stress and reconnect to our hearts, our souls, and our higher minds. But how? Well, let's find out together. My guest on this episode is Christine Comerford. She was named as one of the top 50 uh, human behavior experts to follow in 2017 and one of the global employee engagement influencers that same year. She built and sold five of her own businesses with an average of about a 700% return on investment. So, not bad. Uh, she serves on the board of directors for In the Trenches Advisors for 36 startups. Investors in, in, she's invested in more than 200 startups, including a little company you may have heard of called, uh, what are we called? Uh, Google? Or Google, yeah, something like that. Google, yeah, that's it. Uh, she's consulted with the White House for Clinton and Bush. 700 of the, of the Fortune 1000 businesses she's consulted with. She writes a leadership column for Forbes.com, lectures at Harvard Business School, has appeared on Good Morning America, CNN, CNBC, CMSNBC, Fox Business, PBS, CNET. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author of Smart Tribes, Rules for Renegades, and her latest books, Power Your Tribe, neuroscience-based leadership, cultural coach, and creator of the Beyond the Brain event, ladies and gentlemen, Christine Comerford! It's awesome to be here, Dom. Thank you. <laughs> it's a real pleasure. You know, you and I chatted several months ago. I've been looking forward to our conversation because it's not often that I get to speak to somebody with um, as crazy a background as me, and I'm really looking forward to having that combo. <laughs> but before we start, tell us someone who we likely wouldn't know who's been a major influence on you and on your life. You know, it's easy to sort of cite the, the Martin Luther Kings or the Einsteins or whoever it is, but who's somebody that we probably wouldn't even know? Yes. Um, I had dinner with him um, just a couple nights ago. Um, Jerry Jampolsky. Jerry Jampolsky wrote a book many, many years ago, back when the Phil I love Donahue Jerry. Show. I love oh. Jerry Jampolsky. And I remember <laughs> okay. his book going bestseller because it was brought on the show. It was on the Phil Donahue show. Exactly. Um uh, for those of you who don't remember, it used to be a really popular talk show when it was back on the air. And Jerry is all about um, there's love and there's fear. And you can kind of bring it on down to those two things. As His a book, leader, Love is Letting Go of Fear. Exactly. And um, he's 94 years old now. Wow. Yes. And he is blind. And he is almost deaf. And he is traveling the world still, going all over the world. He has a few trips every single month, and he's wow. still doing his thing. I mean, it's absolutely mind blowing. So, um, yeah, 21 years ago, uh, I met Jerry, and that's where I got my initial hospice training through his organization. And uh, yeah, he's just a remarkable human being. And at 94, he's still. You know, out there doing his thing. It's totally. How weird. did you originally meet Jerry Jampolsky? Yeah, well, it's it's funny. He likes to tell the story. Um, I reached out to his nonprofit. I had somehow read his book. I can't remember how I found his book, but I reached out to his nonprofit. Nobody was calling me back, and finally, I bumped into him at a restaurant, and I said, "You know, you guys have to get your act together because I'm trying to volunteer and I'm trying to, you know, be a donor, and it's just really hard." And he just started laughing. He said, "Have a seat." <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I love that you're so direct, you know, tell me what we need to fix. And we just became dear friends ever since then. And every year we've had dinner probably three times a year, minimum twice a year for the past 21 years. He, he I, you know, that book really revolutionized a lot of people. Love is letting go of fear. Marianne Williamson's book, Return to Love, came out shortly after. They were both yeah. out of the Course in Marigolds, yeah. as I like to call it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you know, uh, Jerry's book, I remember that being on the Phil Donahue show and, and, and I also remember, um, what was her name? Uh, another famous comedian, uh, being on a show and saying this book changed my life and the book went mental Nuts. overnight. Yeah. And I remember seeing Jerry Jampolsky say, you know, he was, when he was at school, his English teacher said to him, whatever you do, never become a writer. <laughs> and that book outsold almost everything at the time. It was amazing. Very cool right. guy. And that, yeah. that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's, yeah. that's very cool. Again, another beautiful crossover. I think I read that book in, oh God, maybe 83 or 84, something like that. So it was a long time ago. Yeah. Long, yeah. long time ago. Yeah. So, so. the Stanford, Stanford Graduate Business, School of Business has done two case studies on your unconventional rise to success as a woman who neither went, uh, neither got a high school diploma or a college degree. Tell us about that, because that's in and of itself quite fascinating for <laughs> Fortune 500 listeners uh, or any leaders listening, and particularly leaders who go through that um, imposter syndrome. Well, you know, Charlie over there has got that degree and I don't have this degree and, you know. Good point. Good point. Okay. And people are talking a lot about imposter syndrome lately too, which mm -hmm. is really a timely topic. So, so basically I just found, um, I, well, I ran away at 16. Let's just start there. And I had a fake ID that said I was 26. Nobody bothered to check. <laughs> you kind of look a little different, 16, 26. And I started working. Um, I had taken a course called EST, Earhart Seminars mm -hmm. Training, which now is kind of a watered down version. It's called Landmark. And, um, and it really changed my life because I got, and it, it was, I was 15 when I took it, 
I got that um, we are 100% responsible for our lives. And um, when I first called to sign up, they said, well, come back when you're 18, you know, you're mm -hmm. underage. And I said, well, there's got to be a way around this. That's like the story of my life. There's got to be a way around this. So I got my parents to go and then write a letter. And so I was like with this room full of adults um, in S. So it was kind of interesting. So afterwards I thought, okay, well, since I'm going to take full responsibility for my life, you know, I'm going to run away because my home situation wasn't so great. I'm going to run away and start my career, you know? And so I went out there into the world, <laughs> not really knowing what I was doing, but I was working at the um, EST office. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned very quickly in a six month period that I wasn't ready to be an adult. So right. I came back, went to high school again, but I couldn't relate, right? Because I'd been to like CBGB's and Studio 54 and the Mud Club, you know, I was in, I was in New York City. And I'm coming back to like this quiet suburb in, you know, uh, in Los Angeles. And I'm like, Football games, team spirit? I don't think so. So I thought, <laughs> this is not going to work. So I went down to UC San Diego and I talked my way into starting. And I said, look, a credit's a credit, right? Take my first year and transfer it back to, to Palos Verdes High School. And then I'll have a, a, high, a high school diploma. And, you know, here I am in college already. And, you know, amazingly, they went for it. So I was able to start college early and, um, and then, uh, Gosh, in my 30s, my mom called me up and said, you got an honorary degree. And I was like, oh, Harvard, maybe, you know, <laughs> and she's like, uh, it's a high school diploma. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't quite what I expected, but, you know, it didn't matter because I, I no. wanted to like get out there and start doing it, you know. You know but that's, you know, I, I love that because I, I was the same. I left school at 14 years old initially. I went back and got some education later, but I left school yeah. at 14 originally, um, you know, and, and just was bored out of my tree. Just like I couldn't relate to what was going on. I couldn't relate to the other kids. I'd already been yeah. studying things that were weird and wacky. And I was certainly not having a conversation with another 14 year old about Kabbalah or, right. or prana yoga or, 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 yeah. <laughs> or any of that stuff. They're like, yeah, yeah. what is, is this kid smoking pot? What's going on? So, and I was the only kid not doing drugs. That was the other weird thing. So, um, so I get that and going out in the world, but carrying that imposter syndrome, it, it doesn't sound like you carried it. Did you not have it? Did it not come up for you? You know, I know what? I carried, it came up for me massive. Yeah. Self-doubt mm. comes up for me, but um, I've always been, and as a woman, it's been really important to do this, to have a track record, mm -hmm. you know? So I've always made sure to have a really clear public track record, seriously, because otherwise you do get a lot of, you know, kind of imposter feedback from others. So right. I think I've dealt more with self-doubt. Can right. I actually do that? Wow, mm -hmm. that looks really kind of hard, you know, mm -hmm. um, versus um, I'm a fraud. It's been so, more self-doubt. So how did you, ha yeah. let's go to that right off the bat. How did you confront that self-doubt yeah. when you know you know when you don't have the quote unquote qualifications yeah um so so bill gates taught me about this which was really useful he taught me that confidence is the decision he said it's really easy to be confident once you have a huge track record mm -hmm. but but it's being it's declaring victory as you step onto the battlefield that's what it is. And he taught me this with Windows because when Windows came out, it was absolutely ridiculed when Windows first came out because mm -hmm. it was a clunky, bad piece of software. Sure. And he kept saying, it's going to be a world standard. It's going to be a world standard. It's just a matter of time. It's going to be a world standard, you know? And he kept saying that for six years and mm -hmm. then it became a world standard. But, you know, he just had that, you know, that I'm going to make this happen. This is going to, it was declaring it. This is going mm -hmm. to be, it's going to take as long as it takes, but it's going to happen. Right. It, that, that's interesting because, uh, and, you know, I am a little bit political, so I'll go there. Yeah, you have a president right now who's declaring kinds of things that don't appear to be apparent. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if he believes it enough, it will happen. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. <laughs> no, you don't need to. It's okay. It's just me. Um, you know, but sort of going into the, this, the, you, you touched on one part of it there. You know, you've built and run your own companies. You've sold yeah. them. You've worked at Microsoft. You've worked at Apple. But like me, you also 
veered off into the, the more metaphysical realms, you were also a, a monk, a Buddhist monk for seven years. So yep. talk to us about that collaboration of having been own, owning your own businesses, working in these, you know, uh, digital God worlds, uh, maybe two of the three digital God worlds and, and, and becoming a Buddhist monk. Those seem to be for most people, I think they were though, particularly corporate people would look at that and go, that's too much of a contradiction. I, I right. you know, they may even have the pull, but they're, they're not going to go there. T talk to us about that. Got it. Good. Okay. So, um, so when I went to college, uh, I was 17 when I got to UC San Diego. Um, pretty quickly, I was pretty jaded. You know, I'd like been in New York City, right? I'd done that whole thing. I was just like, yeah, whatever. You know, I've done nightclubs. I've done being an adult. Is that it? Seriously? Mm -hmm. And I'd been reading Carlos Castaneda and Ram Dass and Grist for the Mill and, you know, wanting to kind of understand, like, what is it? There's right. got to be something more. Seriously. Yeah. You know, it's not just money, sex, and power please right basic stuff mm -hmm. and um and i saw a poster it said learn to meditate and i thought yeah i'll go to that so um fast forward just a handful of months and i took my vows <laughs> i became a buddhist monk when i was 17. so um you know celibacy lots of fasting you know mm -hmm. etc um, vegetarianism and from 17 to 24 i was doing that however it was, we were, we were living like with the same gender. So we'd live like in a house of women, but then we were working out in the world. So we didn't shave our heads or anything. And so we would kind of come back, you know, and be in the um, monastery, if you will, you know, at night, but we actually were out there working. So that's when I discovered computers because people were really confusing to me. I couldn't quite figure out, like they didn't seem logical, but mm -hmm. with software, if you told the computer how to do it the right way with clarity, it would respond. And I thought, wow, yeah. this is such a reflection of one's own mental clarity as well, right? If you communicate yes. the right way, it responds. Huh, I wonder what that would be like with humans. You know, if you communicate, the, the meaning of the message, the meaning of the communication is the message received. Yeah. So that took me further into exploring kind of human awareness and human consciousness. And we weren't calling it neuroscience then. We were calling it human potential and stuff like that. Yeah, we were but, both part of the human potential movement. Yeah. So we were like doing that on our own little tracks, you know, our separate tracks, which is kind of fun that our tracks have come together now. And, um, and what was cool was I kept, I was a little bit of a problematic monk because I kept saying, I think we're going the wrong direction. You know, it was all about going up and out and, and transcending. And I thought, I, I think we need to go in and down first. I think we need to really kind of get in there and deal with our stuff to mm -hmm. clear it so we can then expand. So um, ultimately, I left. I broke my vows because I really thought, oh, I think I need to go in and down. I think that's the way to really understand the meaning of the universe. So um, I did that, and I went from one monastery to another, right? I went to Microsoft, which is essentially, <laughs> at Same that time, uh, it was uh, another uh, sort of monastery. The high priest was, was uh, a different name, but still right. the same, yeah. <laughs> But what was fun was it kind of came full circle because I was a Tibetan Buddhist. I got to uh, support the Dalai Lama on his tour in 2010 for a week. And it was really cool to be with the Dalai Lama for 14, 16 hours a day on his tour and to really see what he was like behind the scenes. And mm -hmm. I tell you, Dob, the more stressed, the more stressed out people got, the, the tired, more tired people got, the funnier the Dalai Lama gets. He is, he's a little mischief maker. Oh, <laughs> he's yeah? fun. Yeah. Right. That's beautiful. <laughs> You know, and, and, and because one of the things that I was looking forward to having our conversation around is the fact that so much of the world of leadership and business um, has been played into, um, and, and this, you and I had discussed this last time, has been played into there is a personal self and there's a professional self. And we, you and I both know those two things. That that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. There's you. Um, yeah. And you and I have both been on great spiritual journeys and, and traveled to, to study that and great deep psychological and neuroscience journeys um, and on the leadership side. And for me, it, it's I can't see a separation between those things. Um, what happens for you? Uh, and I really like for our, our listeners to understand this. What will ha what happens for you when you are? You know, because uh, particularly beyond the brain, your event that's coming up, you know, you you um, you introduce corporate individuals to a world of shamanism, yeah. 
yeah. to a world of um, metaphysical understanding in the context of what they will do with that in leadership. Help us to help our leaders to grasp yeah. that. Okay, thank you. So, so in our ancestors, you know, back when we weren't so digitally distracted and mm -hmm. so continuously um, overwhelmed mm -hmm. with lots of, frankly, meaningless data, um, we're more connected to the earth. And when we reconnect to the earth and the elements and we actually get back in tune with the uh, – how the earth feels the earth actually has been it's been uh, measured many times has a certain magnetic field right does. and when human beings get into a still internal state um our uh magnetic field syncs up with the earth's and then we don't have stress or illness or all sorts of painful bad stuff so as we learn at Beyond Your Brain to really reconnect and we do journeys and we meet our, you know, our guides and stuff like that. And we've had all sorts of, you know, executives from the top echelons as well as from startups. But, but the goal is to reconnect with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I want to take one sec to talk about in and down because I talked about up and out versus in and down. One of the big things that I notice that's happening right now where people can really start to make a difference connecting with themselves is really looking at what their organismic rights are. And Wilhelm Reich, a couple decades ago, really did a bunch of research and found that we have five key organismic rights, the rights of a human organism. Mm -hmm. And these rights are determined unfortunately, by our little baby brain between zero and three years old. We look out at the world, we look at our family, and we decide which rights we have. Now, our little mm -hmm. baby brain isn't cooked yet, right? Our prefrontal cortex, where we have decision-making, understanding things, problem-solving, isn't complete until we're 21 for females and 25 for males. Right. So let's go over the five org rights. I want everybody listening to, to really drop into, where do I need some work? So uh, I want everybody to just pause for a moment here yeah. and get out a pen because this is this is this is important stuff. It's powerful stuff um, because at first and foremost, uh, the the first of these rights is one that I bang into with leaders all the time. Yeah. Who have everything? Yeah. They have everything, meaning you know they have the right partner who looks right. They have the right car that looks right. They have the right watch that looks right. They have the right clothes. They have the right status. And yet they miss this very first need. So these are the five organismic rights from William Reich. And this is powerful stuff. So please take a moment. I'm stopping you so you get a pen and you can actually write this down or you can grab your phone and you can record this. But whatever you need to do, this is important for you to just stop and allow yourself to connect with you rather than out into the world. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Christine, but I just wanted everybody to Thank grasp you. the importance of this, the, the gravity of this. Thank you. And we're going to be providing everybody with a graphic so you can very easily unpack your rights, but also unpack the rights of your colleagues at work. Mm -hmm. You don't have to talk to them about it. You can just use the tools in the, in the infographic they're going to post on the show page to help them shift their rights and expand their rights where they might be a little bit low. Mm -hmm. So the first right is the right to exist. People always say to me, I totally have the right to exist. I'm here. Mm, not necessarily. The right to exist might be low if you tend to intellectualize, okay? If you go into your mind as opposed to into your feelings, where a lot of us go because it feels safer to go into our intellect. Sure. If you avoid being around people that are having a lot of emotion and you're like, whoa, you know, I don't want to exist around that. If you don't feel that you fully have a voice, if you don't express your voice fully and you're not actually standing in and taking up space, you know, in mm -hmm. the universe, if you will, the rights are all connected. So I want us to first notice if, if you can say to yourself, I have the right to exist. And if it sounds like and feels, feels like I want to start getting better at feeling. If it feels like a statement of fact, I have a mobile phone. You know, if you can say I have the right to exist and it really feels honest, okay, great. But I want you to say it to yourself inwardly and notice a scale of zero to five, where mm -hmm. five is the highest. I've never met anybody 
who honestly had a five. Most people have somewhere between zero and three. But just feel into and just ask yourself or say to yourself, I have the right to exist and just jot down what score you would give yourself, what feels honest, okay? And then next, the right to have needs. So if someone is um, often rescuing, taking one for the team, a lot of people I meet don't even know what their needs are beyond the basics, you know? Um, so if we don't know what our needs are, if we are constantly pushing our needs to the side to take care of others, that's low right to have needs, okay? So just drop into that, hmm, how often do I even know what my needs are and do I express them without apologizing, but express them and just say, hey, this is just what I need without anger or any edge. So I have the right to have needs, check in and see how that feels. And then we're going to talk about how these impact the workplace in a couple minutes. And then next, the right to take action. We all know somebody who can't seem to just move forward sometimes. So avoiding accountability, avoiding responsibility, procrastinating perpetually, maybe extreme perfectionism, just can't move forward. Okay. The right to take action. I have the right to take action. Okay. Zero to five. And then next fourth is the right to have consequences for your actions. So some you take an action, doesn't quite work out. Do you blame others? Do you finger point? Or do you say, hey, you know what? I messed up. Here's how I'm going to fix it. So notice yourself as well as those in the workplace. I have the right to have consequences for my actions. Zero to five. Okay. And then the last one, the fifth one, is the right to love and be loved. It's a combo pack. Okay? Mm. It's easy to love, but sometimes people have a hard time letting it all in. Can we let people support us? Can we be comfortable with emotion? Um, can we feel our own emotions? If you look at Travis Bradbury's recent research, only 36% of humans know actually what they're feeling at any given time. And yeah. we're gonna, I'm going to make a note. We're going to put our emotion wheel on the show page because I want you guys to start to notice a few times a day, how am I feeling? And fine is not an emotion, okay? Frustrated, <laughs> tired, scared, anxious, overwhelmed, those are emotions, okay? <laughs> so as you start to look at your org rights, so for instance, a lot of people will say to me, oh, I have a t totally high right to exist. And I'll say, ah, let's talk about your right to have needs. And they're like, well, you know, I don't really express my needs that much. I'm kind of getting, I don't really know what they are. So then my question is, can you have needs if you don't exist? And if you aren't existing, who's having needs? And then they start to go, oh, wow. It's actually, I actually have a lower right to exist than I thought because how am I gonna express my needs if I don't exist? You right. know. So we start to notice the connections. Mm -hmm. um, so I want everybody just to kind of take the time. And in our new book, Power Your Tribe, chapter four, we talk about org rights. And again, we'll put a, an infographic on the show page so you can actually say, ah, if this is a right where I need work, here's how I can actually do it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, this is, I actually made a video about part of this uh, a few weeks ago that I put out. Um, and I'll actually tag it also in, in the show notes um, because the point you've made here that I think is vital for us to understand is, uh, number one, I've said this a million times here on the show too, but the truth of the matter is none of us is fully objective in our subjective realities. You don't really understand you because you can't fully step outside of you. And I realize that many people are quite enlightened and have done a great job of it, but you can't fully do that. Uh, and so you actually have to have ways of recognizing your own object, uh, becoming objective about your own subjective reality. And I did this video around this. Do you have the right to have needs or are you on the planet to serve the needs of others? And, and it's, it's very, uh, you know, you can feel peacocky about having, you know, being of service. I mean, I'm of service. That's why I'm on the planet. I'm certainly yeah. here to be of service. But that can be egoic, and a lot of the spiritual language is actually egoic. And that's and one of the things that I liked about what you and I were talking about is, you know, I've uh, done a lot of training with high-level individuals, teaching them about 
be careful of, of not egotizing your spirituality. Spiritual ego is the same thing. You know, well, I did this and I did est and I, you know, I studied with Christine and I studied with right. Dove and I went and spent time in Tibet and, you know, so I'm what? So now you've got bragging rights. Yeah. This is, this is another, this is another Rolex. It's not yeah. the same thing. But one of the tests is, do I have the right to my needs? And so very often with an executive, I'll say, tell me about being touched. Yeah. I just use the basic one. Tell me about being touched. And they go, what do you mean? Do you like being touched? Oh, yeah. No. Do you like being touched in a non-sexual way? Oh, no, I don't like that. Ah, Uh, what's wrong with that? Why not? And it's like, you don't have the need to be touched. Now, when you were a child, you needed that for your brain to actually start wiring properly. Yeah. And you don't have that need. Yet you put all your value in your brain, yet your brain didn't get to wire properly because you never are not comfortable with being touched because you yeah. probably missed that somewhere. Yep. And so if you could just own that need, yep. what would happen? And it's like, right. Poof, head explodes. Because as you said, if I don't have the need to be touched if i don't allow myself the ownership of the need to be touched then do i exist and like you said they all stack on top of each other if i don't have the right to be loved and to love then do i have needs no do i have do i have the right to exist no they're all none of them are separate so i love this because like i said i did this video on it and i was like people responded to this with like it blew their minds to make them think about something so basic yep and so very important so I want you to help us translate that into the leadership world. And so when you go out into the, into the workforce as okay. a leader who's just gone through this, yeah. uh, whose mind has just fallen out of their left ear, um, how do they take that into the workforce? How do they like, take that to their peers? Okay, so, so I want to I wanna put one little sticky note on this for starters sure. before we go in here. So um, I talk a lot about the importance of safety and belonging and mattering. Absolutely. You know? in order that we need to cultivate that in our culture. And I want to unpack the word uh, belonging. Um, It comes from um, belongen, Middle English. And belongen means to deem suitable. Mm -hmm. What we used to say um, back in olden times, say you were considering buying a horse dove, okay? Mm -hmm. You would say... Which I have a lot of use for. Yeah. (laughs) Living in the city. <laughs> right. I belong in, I deem suitable, I belong in that horse. Hence, I will mm-hmm. purchase it. Okay? Mm-hmm. So one thing that I really notice is back to social attachment theory, which you were talking about with the touching and, you mm-hmm. know, that zero to three, so important for us. Mm-hmm. Zero to three is really important. Zero to seven is really important. Zero to 12 is really important. After that, I hate to bum your high, but many of us just repeat the same experiences until we get some executive coaching to change them. Exactly. Um, but, uh, but let's come back to belonging for a second. Um, if human beings don't belong, right, we die. Right. You know, we have, we're the only creature on this planet that has to be fed, taken care of, et cetera, et cetera, for so many years before we're independent. And when we look at, this is extreme, I know, when we look at like serial killers, you know, people who shoot up schools, et cetera, the number one thing people say about them is, well, gosh, you know, he was kind of a loner. You know, he never really fit in. You know, so the belonging problem started early on and then became, frankly, disastrous. Mm -hmm. Kids in gangs, they'll do anything to belong. They'll even kill to get in and stay in the gang. So I want us to get really conscious for how important it is to belong and check in with our own experience of are we trying to belong to the Rolex crowd? Are we trying Mm -hmm. to belong to the, a huge one that I see, a huge tribe that I see is the Tesla tribe. Oh, Mm -hmm. I belong to the Tesla tribe. You know, sooner or later, we have to call off the search. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is nothing outside. I am positive that is going to fill you inside. And the eight billionaires that I've coached and the two U.S. presidents have made it absolutely clear (laughs) that I'm positive and there's nothing outside that's going to work. So if we start to really get present to where do I belong? Who do I belong with? Do I belong back to Beyond Your Brain, our retreat that I do? Do I belong with this planet? Do I belong here? Do I belong with whatever your version of spirituality or God is? You know, who is truly your tribe? Yes, you have your work tribe. You might not choose to have the same people in your personal life, but we all have these different tribes that we belong to. And 
once we understand org rights, we can start to increase our org rights, but we can also be more compassionate with others. So if somebody plays small and they're really quiet in meetings and you go, ah, you know what? I think they have a low right to exist. We then can sit down with them privately. Don't freak them out in the middle of the meeting and talk with them about taking a bigger role about how we want to hear their voice, about participating more in meetings, about bringing you know, what they have that's so powerful um, into that particular setting to benefit others. If we tie things to benefiting others, that then touches on the belonging. Because mm -hmm. many of us won't do it for ourselves, but we will do it for others. And if we can get as many concentric circles as possible, wow, that would really help Bob and Mary. It would help our junior leaders see what leadership looks like. It would help our department, our division, our organization. Now the person's like, oh, if, if I'm going to belong with all that, yeah, okay, I'll stretch. Mm -hmm. uh, right to have needs. Really starting with the really basic ones, food, water, shelter, warmth, touch, right? As we start to really go, wow, you know, what do I really need? Because when I find, oh, I was doing a, a workshop at Amazon. It was so awesome on org rights. And this really macho guy from the warehouse stood up, really big macho guy. And he said, you know what? I've realized that I have a low right to have needs. I'm rescuing and taking care of people all day long. And I thought that's what servant leadership was. But I've realized if I don't put my oxygen mask on first, right, I can't help others, but also you guys all know that I get kind of angry and that's coming from resentment and that's coming from not honoring my needs. So what I want to say to all you guys, there were 65 people there. What I want to say to all you guys is I am, I am now working on honoring my right to have needs and I will be working on figuring out what my needs are. And I'll be asking you in a very respectful way, you know, to help me get my needs met. And I also won't be self-sacrificing anymore because it doesn't really help any of us. And I was mm -hmm. like, right on brother, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, right to take action, help that person get an accountability partner. That's a great thing, let them pod up, if you will. Yes. Make sure that they know what success is, because often we do drive by delegation, right? Well, you do that, 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 no questions, goodbye. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the person's like, what was just asked for? Mm -hmm. um, right to take action, so let's look at if somebody starts to kind of finger point, say, just a sec, let's unpack this. Um, what worked in whatever happened here? And what would we like to have seen more of? Let's just unpack it. Instead of what went right, what went wrong, because they're just going to go into fight, flight, freeze. Mm -hmm. You know, what worked, what we'd like to see more of. Um, and then if we come down to right to love and be loved, the emotion wheel is so helpful for that really being able to sit with and say, okay, great. I'm feeling really overwhelmed. I'm not going to smoosh it down. I'm just going to say, hey, guys, I'm really overwhelmed. I'm going to take a time out. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to be okay. Using the outcome frame is great for all of these, which is first feeling what you're feeling, looking at the emotion wheel. We'll put it on the show page and then saying, well, what would I like? Something mm -hmm. you can maintain. What will having that do for me? How will I feel? What would the benefits be? How will I know when I have it? What's the proof going to be? What a value might I risk or lose? Well, gosh, I might not feel as important, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever question number four's answer is, we'll put an outcome frame on the show page. That helps you understand why you don't have what you want. Mm -hmm. And then what are my next steps? So I want us to all start to turn, turn the focus inward and say, how am I doing? How is my life going? What do I, what would I like more of? in terms of my experience of myself. Mm -hmm. How connected do I feel to myself? Can I sit quietly out in nature and not feel compelled to check my phone or whatever? You know, how comfortable yeah. are we with stillness? And, uh, one of the things I deeply believe in and, and teach my, my clients is uh, loneliness is when you're missing you. Mm, that's good. And so often we you know, we're looking to fill the hole in our soul with something or someone else. Yeah. And until we can be with ourselves, and uh, um, that loneliness will never go away. Yeah. Um, and and it is going through those needs because you've got your, you know, you, you we can break these up into many different things, whether whether it's. Um, yeah. Maslow's hierarchy of needs, whether it's the three basic human needs of survival, whether it, you know, it's the ugly needs. 
understanding that every one of those shows that at a basic level, human beings have needs. And, and it's fascinating to me. That's why I did that video I told you about, which fascinating to me because I was sitting with a very, very senior executive, very powerful woman who didn't have needs. I mean, she actually said, I don't have needs. And I'm like, my Whoa. God, Whoa. you don't yeah. have needs? And she's <sighs> like, no. And I'm like, wow. And I, and I just said, and I got choked up and I said, yeah. do you know, that, you know, what's really weird. And she goes, what? She goes, I'm more upset about that than you are. And she's like, she's like, I, I don't understand. I said, yeah, I know. I understand. Talk about and, being and, disconnected with self. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and at the same time, that part of us that recognizes, and this is the, my personal work with my clients, a part of us that recognizes mm -hmm. and goes, there's something wrong here. Yeah. There's something missing and I don't know what it is. So maybe what I need is another billion dollars. So maybe right. what I need is, <laughs> is to buy myself or my partner a new set of tits or yeah. what I need is a new Tesla or right. what I need is a new Bugatti or what I need is a Whatever. new something. And, and, my, and what I always say to my clients is that I want you to know something. All those things work. And they go, really? And I go, absolutely, for about 10 seconds. Right. <laughs> You'll get the dopamine hit, bam. And, and then it will work. <laughs> but the crash is enormous. Yeah. And the problem with it is, is you're, you're chasing the dragon in a neurological, biological level. You are getting the hit, but the hit is weaker and weaker and you need a bigger and bigger hit. And there's no difference between it and drugs. And, drug and what do we know about drugs? Well, we know, you know, all the ideas we had about drugs are wrong. And what we actually know is that people who have addiction problems actually have community problems. They're not connected. They don't belong. When I worked with street kids yeah. like 30 years ago, well, guess what I found? They hung there because it was a family. It was a tribe. It was a community. And that's what they wanted. And the work that you and I both do inside corporations is teaching them how to build a culture. And I, I'm very honest about it. I say, listen, if we bring down the word culture, what do you recognize in that word that's familiar? And they go, I don't know. I go, try cult. It's the same word. So what does that mean? It's let's have a beneficent cult that honors people as a, you know, and create, helps them to create the cult of one, right? Which is to get connected to yourself, but to have them join together in this desire for bringing a purpose to, to the surface that makes a, a shift in the world for a better place. But first by being empowered. And it's like, wow, really? Yeah. Because I've got news for you. The cappuccino machine and the foosball machine and the bean bags are not going to work for very long. What you need to do is have people want to be there because this is my peeps. This yeah. is my tribe. This is, you know, and, and I love that you're talking about this and bringing this to the fore so people can really grasp this because it is, it's basic, but profound. Yeah. It's, it's, um, appears to be woo-woo, but it's neurological, it's neuroscience, it's biology, um, it's more than psychology, and, and this is what it is. If this, we, You and I know very well that many of these top leaders are feeling incredibly isolated, yeah. and we need to help them to feel more fulfilled. So, so I want to I um, piggyback on what's, something you've just said. Um, let's talk about the physiology of mm -hmm. emotional engagement. Um, and it is one hormone and two neurotransmitters. And the hormone, and here's what we're talking about, right, is oxytocin, mm -hmm. the bonding the hormone, bonding hormone. The yep. feeling connected to others. If you're not sure what oxytocin feels like, you can't do this in the workplace. <laughs> hug somebody for 20 seconds. 20 seconds, a little bit too long in the workplace. But <laughs> go home, hug somebody for 20 seconds. It can be a dog. People always ask me, can it be a dog or a cat? Yes, it can. Okay. Mm -hmm. One, 100, two, 100, et cetera. You need 20 seconds because that'll cover everybody. Some people will get it much faster, but 20 is safe for everybody. And then you'll feel what it feels like to be connected to something. Okay. So we need that feeling of connection, those shared activities. A lot of those come from shared values because the values of a company, if they're done right, bring us together. Oh, this is who we are. They also provide a code of conduct. Mm -hmm. oh, this is how we behave here. So this is how I will be safe in the tribe. This is how I belong to the tribe. Oh, and if I'm really good at these values, this is how I'll matter in the tribe and get status within the tribe, which is super important. 
So looking at what those values are, noticing how they create that experience or the, the release, if you will, of oxytocin. Next, serotonin, feel good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter, mostly responsible for feeling good. Now, oxytocin and serotonin are connected, which is awesome. But if you look at what are all the ways somebody feels good, okay, being celebrated, coming together, knowing that they fit in, knowing that they have equal value, being acknowledged and appreciated for their unique gifts, having clarity on how they're going to succeed, feel good. Next, as you mentioned before, dopamine. Mm -hmm. Dopamine is, it's a neurotransmitter that does a lot of things, but the most important thing with dopamine is really, um, in business at least, is that it um, inspires reward-motivated behaviors. Oh, so if we really honor accountability in our tribe, then if I'm a super account, if I'm an accountability superstar, then I will get rewarded. Um, if we're cold and hungry right now, but I see exactly how we're going to get to the promised land, you know, where everything is awesome. So if we look at what are the cultural rituals and programs, we talk a lot about this in Power Your Tribe, our new book. If we look at what are those rituals and programs that create the firing, the release in our body of oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine, that also will help us look at how we bring people together in a, frankly, a structured way that honors their physiology and builds that emotional engagement. Yeah, these, these are so, so important for people to get, you know, and, and again, neurological, biological, doesn't matter how rational, logical you think you are and how you don't have these emotional, you know, when, you know, and the argument with that lady when she said, why don't I have needs? Well, I'm just not that kind of an emotional person. Uh, then you're dead. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. said, when, and I asked her, I, you know, because I'm me, I said, so please tell me, when did they actually bury you? I, I, you know, it's very, you're doing a very good impersonation of somebody who's actually alive. Uh, this is the thing is that this has been going on since birth, you know, and you've overcompensated and done a marvelous job of it because you've got a tremendous success. And I respect that. But it doesn't. But it doesn't matter to me. I respect it, but it doesn't matter. I respect what you did to get there. But I care about you, the soul, the human being that is within that, and that's so very much a challenge. Christine, tell me what what's the most common misunderstanding about what it is that you do? Yes. Oh, well, you you just alluded to it. Well, you know, emotions they have no place in the workplace. So if we look at research from MIT, Stanford, Harvard, UCLA, Columbia, NYU, Carnegie Mellon, we'll see that 90% of our decisions, of our behaviors, are, are driven, are dominated, keyword, by our emotional brain. So we'd like to walk around going, oh, I'm a great intellect, da, 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 da. I trained my intellect at all sorts of great universities. That's only 10%. Mm -hmm. of what motivates our decisions and our behaviors. 90% is our emotional brain. Whoa. So emotions, back to, your, to the woman you were working with, emotions are to humans like wings are to a bird. I mean, emotions are how we experience the world. So if we've cut ourselves off emotionally, we are pretty darn robotic. Mm -hmm. And we're missing what it's like to be alive. Mm -hmm. So it's like, deeply tragic. So what we do when we go in and we do executive coaching, we do workshops, et cetera, we help people in three areas, bringing neuroscience to sales and marketing so they can really get inside the brain of their buyer and understand what that experience is and walk with them through their emotional process, if you will, to purchase sales mm -hmm. and marketing leadership to lead and enroll and engage and align people more powerfully and culture to build the, the structures, the programs, et cetera, to become a best places to work, to have really high engagement scores, to have people be 35 to 50% more productive, to have 90% plus retention, you know, to, to not have to deal with turnover and a lot of recruiting because that's a hassle, especially these days. So once people get through that, ah, we are emotional beings, ah, if we understand just enough about the brain, then we can move forward. Okay, mm -hmm. great. If we understand some basics, like, what critter state is, you know, when we're in fight, flight, freeze, we call it critter state just to make it a little bit more fun. It's like a little animal, safe or not, mm -hmm. dead or not. <laughs> Smart state is when we're in all three parts of our brain, reptilian, mammalian, neocortex, all working well together. And once we create the, we don't have to judge people anymore. We can just say, oh, George, 
that behavior that he's doing that's problematic, it's just because he's asking for, subconsciously, some belonging. Sue over there, she's just asking for some safety. We don't need to judge Sue or label her a problem. Let's bring her some safety. Let's sit down with Sue and say, hey, I'm here with you. I've got you. Together, we're going to figure this out. We're going to create a plan, a backup plan, or a backup plan to the backup plan. I'm going to be with you this whole way. You know, when we can look at and say, ah, oh, well, you know, Tim over there is struggling with the right to take action. Let me go bring some tools over to him. So mm-hmm. now we don't have to judge everybody all the time. We can actually just go, ah, oh, this is what they need. Got it. Because servant leadership isn't about self-sacrifice. It's about paying attention to your people, not having judgment. Oh, I have to rescue them because they're so freaking not together. Okay, no. <laughs> it's looking at them going, ah, this is what they need. Thank you. Thank you, tools. You know, people love our mm-hmm. smart tribes tools because they can go, that behavior, this is the tool I need. I bring it, and then the behavior changes. Mm-hmm. Human beings will always choose the behavior on their behavioral menu that feels best at the given time. Absolutely. And in some, some situations, we don't have a lot of choices on our menu, like during mm-hmm. performance reviews, right? We have probably defensiveness, you know, <laughs> fear, <laughs> right. shut down, right? right? Or boasting, right? And as we create a culture where it's okay to be human, where we're navigating each other's needs and org rights and safety, belonging, mattering, et cetera, where we're helping people have insights and aspiration, we're paying attention to those three, the the two neurotransmitters, the one hormone, we now can actually honor human beings Mm -hmm. and have a humane workplace instead of a workplace driven by fear, which we still have a lot of, Dov. You've seen it. Sadly, it, it's true, but I think you're absolutely right, and, and um, it, it's vital for us to, to recognize, um, you know, I posted a question on Facebook recently where I asked, uh, what do you see as the future of leadership? And it's fascinating to watch what people write, mm-hmm. you know, and, and because for me, and I know for you too, the future of leadership is is humanity. It's being human. It's connecting to the humanity of the individual. As we become more and more AI driven, yep. we are going to have to go the other way in order yep. to survive. And that is to get more emotionally connected to ourselves, not emotionally off the off your rocker, but just, you know, understanding that you have needs, understanding that you are an emotional being and that you have to connect with other human beings. And as we become more and more isolated, the backlash of that will be that we'll have to actually become more connected. Uh, I don't see the isolation as a long-term problem. I see it as a long-term symptom that will will show us the problem and make us go to the cause, which is, we got to connect to ourselves, which is the real, the real cause. So this is fascinating. Um, before we we move in towards the to the ends of our time here, um, we you and I live in a time where uh, of where people are terrified of make of offending people and being politically correct and all the rest of the nonsense. What is your what is your bravest opinion? What is the opinion that might piss a few people off? Uh, might upset some people, but it's just like, you know what, this needs to be said. What what would you say is your bravest opinion? Ah, uh, um, <laughs> um, I, I have actually let go of several clients as a result of this, so maybe this is a good one. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and that is that um, leaders, and it might sound obvious, but until you live it, it's a little different. Um, leaders, the culture of a company, the performance of your people, the happiness of your people, the engagement of your people is a direct, direct reflection of how you are showing up as a leader. So all of leaders call me up going, um, oh, you know, I need to fix my people. And I'll say, you know, we're, we might not be the right firm for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because dude you got to pick up the mirror and look at it yeah. so i find like people will pay lip service to that but when they actually look at what behaviors they need to change so for instance i was i was coaching one of our uh clients recently and she was like oh you know i'm going to support our our um our employees in this and i'm going to do that and i'm going to bend over backwards here and i'm going to you know because because i really love our people and i said um uh, where's the manipulation in that? 
<laughs> oh, you nasty, nasty girl. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> and she was like, manipulation? I'm like a saint. You know, I'm like helping everybody and saving everybody. And I said, for what purpose? You're in and the triangle of manipulation. Hero, she, victim, uh, yeah. martyr. And she started to realize, um, yeah, I'm doing this because it makes me feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. and I said, and how do you think it makes them feel? And she realized that she swings. We say, and it's the same sort of thing. We say victim, rescue, or persecutor. She swings between rescuer and then she gets really mad persecutor, right? Mm -hmm. I said, what if you just could be like more balanced by not overgiving, which then made you rage at them, right? How about just being authentic, mm -hmm. you know? And that's going to require her to strip off this mask that she was raised with. Of course. Right? And her, her, it goes back for generations. So we're doing mask work now, which is some of the deepest leadership work a person can do. And it's very challenging for one's identity because it helps them see that big parts of what they thought they was so noble and awesome about what they did is actually BS. Mm -hmm. And that's why they don't have rapport with themselves. Because the number one thing we have to all work on is rapport with ourselves connection to ourselves then we can show up authentically then people can feel our, our our authenticity and then they want to lead us and then we all can communicate openly and freely because it's a big collaboration that's what a company is um, beautiful so beautiful. anyway as we come close to the end um, we're going to move into uh some some uh quick fire questions but before we do i want to ask you this question because it's easy, I've said this many times on the show here, it's easy for people listening in to watch and to go, oh, Christine, she sold this. Dov is so that. This guest is so this. I can never be that. And they start oh. making themselves separate from. So one yeah. of the questions I love to ask my guests, my honored guests, is what are you still working on? Because I want people to grasp that this is, you're not there. There is no there. What are you, what's a, what's a, a personal thing that you're still working on that you go, you know, huh, you know, it, it can still get a bit frustrating after 150 years in my case. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm well, for starters, I'm working on a lot. Okay. Sure. <laughs> One of the big things I'm working on is, um, and I've been working on this for a really long time is it's not the imposter, right? It's the good enough, mm -hmm. you know? Um, because I've noticed that a lot of the behavior, the self-sacrificing, rescuing stuff that I do is an attempt to feel good enough. Good enough according to whom? Exactly. I, I thought it was my parents. My parents have both passed away. So then I thought it was God. God doesn't care. God's like, you're good enough already. You were born good <laughs> enough. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really looking at, this is some mask work, right? So where does this good enough concept come from? And Forget the doing and get really deeply into the being mm -hmm. and being able to just be a lot more and do a lot less because I've kind of achieved enough, you know, right. in this lifetime. Beautiful. Look, yeah. So just that the value of being, we have value because we're here. We're born valuable. Exactly. So that's what you have to do to be valuable. You do stuff because it's cool experiences you want to have. Then there's nothing really to fix. You're already, yeah. you're, because there's nothing broken. There's a lot hidden, but nothing yeah. broken. Yeah. And we're excavating all the time. That's all we're doing. Yeah. What makes you cry? Oh, um, I cried the other night. I might cry talking about it. I cried the other night Ugh. when I was with Jerry, you know, I had to keep it together during dinner. But as I was like cutting up his food and making sure that he got some on his fork, you know, I was like, here's this amazing guy, you know, and he's 94. And, you know, we're not going to have him with us that much longer. And uh, yeah, I'm moved by people, you know, mm -hmm. when I do a coaching session afterwards and someone is like crazy courageous and they just move through tons of stuff. When the session is over, I'll have a little cry. Yeah. Because I'll be so moved by their courage and beauty. Humanity really moves me. Yeah. yeah I, I got to say that that's one of the things that will make me cry is yeah. when somebody's lights go on. 
and they've been fumbling around in the darkness and suddenly their lights go on. That is so awesome for me. So such a, a wonderful, wonderful gift when that happens. Yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, what makes you cry laughing? <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw this movie recently, The Spy Who Dumped Me, and I was laughing so hard. The flight attendant actually came over to make sure I was okay. <laughs> what was it called? The Spy Who Dumped Me. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Seriously, it's, it's because these people, it's so cute. These two women, they're trying so hard, and they're just fumbling and bumbling, but they're really trying. <laughs> and I was just laughing my head off. I mean, just some yeah. of the decisions they were making, it was like noble, but they were just not quite working, you know, <laughs> they just kept pursuing, <laughs> it was just cute, it was yeah. cute funny, you know. What's a, what's a guilty pleasure of Christine Comerford? Ah, oh, chocolate, <laughs> in any form. So often the answer, so often. In a parallel universe, what's your career? In a parallel universe, you know, I've, I've always thought, it would be super cool to be an angel. How cool to be able to float down and to like give people warnings so they don't go, you know, veering off and causing themselves and others pain and, you know, showing them, oh, if you walk over here, you know, you might see something neat. And then I realized, you know, maybe that's maybe a tiny smidge of what I'm doing this lifetime is in training. In training. <laughs> in training. Maybe one so, day be able to be an angel. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you, after your after your name, you can now add letters, A, I, T. T Angel in training. <laughs> you know, instead of PhD, it's A I T. A I T. You know what? We have to tell people where to go if they want to go to our retreat. Well, we I want to I want to tell them that right now. I okay, want I want you to okay. I want you to let everybody know where they can find out more about you, yep. where they can find out about all the wonderful resources that you have. Cool. Uh, we have and we have tons of cool stuff on our website. Smarttribesinstitute.com is our website. The resources section has assessments and infographics and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and uh, our retreat, which we hold once a year, it's coming up in September, mid-September, and uh, it's uh, smarttribesinstitute.com/sti retreat. Um, and also we mentioned it on the homepage, Beyond Your Brain. Boom, that's what it's called. Okay, we will make sure those are all posted. We'll also make sure the infographics are there too for people to, to tune into those. Um, is there any other place that's good, a good place for people to tap into your resources or find out more about you or your speaking or your books or any of those kinds of things? Um, there are a bunch of video tutorials on PowerYourTribe.com. PowerYourTribe.com. Um, yes. So if you want to really work on becoming more emotionally resilient, which frankly, I think we all need to work on, mm -hmm. um, PowerYourTribe.com has lots of little like mini lessons. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, thank you, Christine. This has been a joy and a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope you'll stay with us to the end. And for you, dear listener, as always, please, please, please do not listen to this show. That's not enough. It's never enough. Information is worth the hole in the donut. Transformation comes from application. So take the time to take some notes. Take the time to listen back and go and use the skills, the tools that have been so generously shared with you. Remember, you can hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any other past episode by going to our Facebook page, Dove Varen's Leadership and Loyalty Podcast, to find out how you can hire me, Dove Varen, as a speaker or strategist for your organization. You can go to Full Monty Leadership dot com forward slash consulting or false monty leadership dot com forward slash speaking please be aware that the research consistently shows that the fastest growing companies face the same challenges as probably you do they're spending a ton of money energy time attracting training and developing top talent only to have them leave at an alarming rate if you're frustrated with investing in the training and development of your talent only have them leave before you get your roi and come talk to us at full monty leadership dot com where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets inside of your organization by tapping into purpose, fullmontyleadership.com, because you can't outsource authenticity. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Until next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about your right to exist, your right to have needs, 
and every other right that you actually have. And remember that servant leadership is not about being a dishcloth, it's not about being a door rag, and it's not about taking care of everybody else. It's about taking care of your own heart, your soul, and your mind so that you can serve at a deeply, truly level. My name is Dov Varon, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness to reach the next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out. Thank you.